So this week, you're learning about long-term assets. Uh, long-term assets generally include uh, three primary types. We have our fixed assets, which are often called plant assets or property, plant, and equipment, PPE. We also have our intangible assets, um, which are those long-term assets that lack physical substance. And then some companies will also have natural resources uh, to report. Um, those might be like mining companies or drilling companies or, or something, uh, something like that. So the first group of long-term assets that we're going to talk about are going to be fixed assets. So again, these are things like property, plant, equipment, um, and a key, uh, key thing to remember um, about fixed assets is the thing that differentiates a fixed asset from a long-term investment is fixed assets are going to be used in the normal operation of the company. So it's going to be used to help the company generate revenue doing whatever they are in business to do. So think things like the, the factories, um, the equipment um, within them, you know, even like the office, uh, you know, spaces where <clears throat> maybe like the, you know, like the sales and the marketing folks uh, work, but it's, you know, it's something that's used in the company's uh, normal day-to-day -day, uh, business operations. Okay, so <clears throat> that's that's the question to ask. If it's not, if, if, an, if an asset is not used in the company's day-to-day -day business operations, then we are uh, looking at an investment versus a fixed asset. So most of what we're going to talk about here on this lesson is going to be focused on fixed assets, okay? So <clears throat> let's look at a few types of fixed assets that are pretty common uh, for a lot of companies to have. Buildings, okay? Now, when it comes to fixed assets, we we know that we record fixed assets at historical cost. Historical cost generally includes all of the expenses that are ordinary and necessary to get that asset ready to use, okay? So for example, if we're talking about a building, um, we might be able to include in that cost any uh, architectural fees, engineering fees, um, sales taxes, um, some of the things that they have listed here are, are really iffy. It's going to depend on, um, you know, the, the asset and what it takes to get that asset up and running. For example, insurance cost incurred during construction can be capitalized. Insurance cost following uh, construction, once the asset's completed, those become uh, just regular uh, expenses and are no longer able to be capitalized. The same thing with repairs and reconditioning. So we have to really look and make sure that those things are happening during the construction period in order for them to be uh, capitalized as part of the building. Um, a lot of times in our problems, they'll go ahead and give us the historical cost of the building or they'll let us know what the expenses are uh, to get it up and ready, but those are just some things to keep in mind. Similar for uh, machinery and equipment, whatever it takes to get that asset to our property physically installed and up and running, that's going to be all part of the historical uh, cost. Land, normally you're just going to have maybe some, you know, some purchase fees and, uh, you know, legal fees that, that happen with the purchase of land. And as we are going to learn, land is uh, essentially the only fixed asset that we are not going to record depreciation expense for. Now, um, sometimes people question why is that? And the uh, basically the, the reasoning uh, that the accounting bodies have always given for not depreciating land is because it has an unlimited useful life, okay? And for that reason, there is no useful life to, to allocate uh, the cost across, so therefore we do not record depreciation expense. Um, land improvements, um, we do record depreciation expense on land improvements. Um, these are generally just going to be things like uh, parking lots, um, you know, uh, trees and shrubs maybe around the, the factory or around uh, the corporate office, you know, these types of things. Major long-term improvements that are done uh, to the land, but it's not actually, uh, you know, the land itself. Okay, 
So now we're going to look at some <clears throat> different methods of recording depreciation expense. Now, the first thing I want to point out is when we talk about depreciation, you know, I think there are different definitions that people have of depreciation. And a lot of times outside of the accounting world, when we hear the term depreciation, we assume that we're talking about a loss in value, okay? For accounting purposes, that's not really the definition of depreciation. For accounting purposes, depreciation expense is simply a cost allocation. We are taking the cost uh, of, a, of a major asset that we're going to use over multiple accounting periods, and we are going to attempt to spread that cost or allocate that cost across the periods for which that asset is going to help us generate revenue. <clears throat> now, that goes back to the matching principle that you learn. Remember, the matching principle says that we match our expenses against the revenues they help to generate. That is <clears throat> the underlying principle of depreciation. We are going to match the cost of this long-term asset against the revenues that it generates over multiple years, okay? So <clears throat> for today, we are going to uh, use this little forklift here as our example, okay? So this little forklift costs $24,000, and it has an estimated residual value of $2,000. Now, residual value is sometimes called salvage value. Basically, what it means is at the end of the useful life of this asset, we think we can sell it for scraps for $2,000. Okay, that's what we think we can get out of it at the very end of its useful life uh, for our purposes. So that gives us a depreciable cost of $22,000. So what that means is when we record depreciation, we are only going to record $22,000 of depreciation expense. We are not going to depreciate the full $24,000 because we believe that we will be able to recoup that other $2,000 at the end of the asset's useful life, okay? So in this case, we are estimating that this forklift is going to last us for five years. So we are going to try to attempt to allocate that $22,000 uh, across that five-year useful life um, using a few different approaches. And we're going to look at it. We're, we're going to look at a few different ones here. All right. So the three primary methods um, that you're going to learn about are we have straight line depreciation. I can tell you this is the most commonly used due to its simplicity. Um, we have units of activity, sometimes called units of production. And then we have the double declining balance method. Um, this is a method of accelerated depreciation. So sometimes you'll just hear this called accelerated depreciation methods. It could be double declining balance. It could be 150% declining balance. Um, it's a method in which we essentially front load our depreciation expense. We record more depreciation expense um, early on in the asset's life and less depreciation uh, as the asset ages. And we'll talk more about the reasoning behind that when we get to that. Um, now, one thing that they point out here, and it is significant, um, companies don't necessarily have to use the same method for all of their fixed assets. So it is possible that a company could use one method for their buildings, another method for their equipment. Um, and that sort of thing. Again, in practice, the straight line method is the most common just due to its simplicity, but companies are required to disclose the depreciation methods um, that they use in the footnotes to their consolidated financial statements. Okay, so let's start with the straight line method. Okay, this one is super easy and super straightforward. We take the cost minus the residual value. Okay, we talked about that previously, it's $22,000. We simply divide that by the useful life, and that gives us the amount of depreciation that we are going to record every year. So in this case, it is uh, $4,400. That is going to be the depreciation expense that is recorded in year one, year two, year three, year four, and year five. So we are recording the exact same amount of depreciation across all five years. At the end of year five, we will have recorded total depreciation of $22,000, which is the depreciable cost. Okay, now the units of activity method, um, also called the units of production, okay? This is really only going to be applicable uh, for assets where we can easily uh, measure the productivity. Um, think about 
a machine that measures the number of hours on it. Or think about a vehicle that measures the number of miles on it. it ha we have to be able to easily, um, uh, easily measure the activity. Otherwise, this method isn't really going to work. Okay? So this formula, as you'll see, looks very, very similar to the straight line uh, formula. But in this case, we are computing a rate. Okay? So we are going to take the cost minus residual value, which in our case is the 24,000 minus the 2,000 or the 22,000, all right? That's our depreciable base. And this time we are going to divide it by some sort of total estimated units of activity. That is going to give us our rate. And then so for each uh, accounting period, we're just gonna look at how much we use that asset and apply that rate. So let's look at how that might apply to uh, the forklift here. Okay, in this case, um, we are estimating that this forklift is going to have a useful life of 10,000 operating hours. Okay, so that's our estimated total units of activity. That's what we think we're going to get out of this asset. Okay, um, so uh, once, once we've gotten 10,000 uh, hours out of this asset, we're going to be done with it. Okay, we're, we're just going to sell it for scraps for the $2,000. Okay, so to get our rate per hour, we are going to take the $22,000 depreciable cost. We are going to divide that by the 10,000 uh, total estimated hours we think we can get out of this forklift. And that tells us that we are going to allocate $2.20 per hour for each hour that we use this forklift. Now, in this case, they tell us in the first year that we logged 2,100 hours on it. Okay, so to compute our depreciation expense for that year, we're simply going to take $2.20 per hour times 2,100 hours gives us $4,620. That is the amount of depreciation expense that we will record for year one, okay? And for the remaining years, we just record it based on the number of hours uh, that we use it. And so what you'll notice here is with the units of activity or units of production method, um, the depreciation expense is kind of all over the place. Okay, remember with the straight line method, we recorded the exact same amount every year. Um, with units of activity, it, it's, it's kind of all over the place. It just depends on, on you know, how much, um, how much the asset is used in any given year. All right, now we're going to shift to accelerated methods. And we're going to focus specifically on the double declining balance method. Uh, but again, any method that front loads depreciation in the early part of an asset's life is going to be considered an accelerated method. Now, the logic behind accelerated methods of depreciation is essentially this. Um, assets are normally, especially, especially when we're talking about equipment machinery, assets are often going to be most useful and most productive in the early parts of their life when they're new, okay? So um, if, if, we, if we follow that assumption there that they're going to be most productive in the, in the early parts of their life, we can assume that they are going to be generating the most revenue, you know, because they're going to be, uh, you know, producing the most units or, or, or whatever uh, during the early part of their lives. Now, as the, as the equipment or machinery gets older, it's normally going to be less productive and it's also going to require a lot more maintenance and repairs. So part of the logic behind an accelerated method is we record higher depreciation expense in those earlier years where we don't have a lot of repair and maintenance. And then in the later years, we're recording less depreciation expense, but we're probably offsetting that with a lot of maintenance and repairs just, just to keep the, the machinery up and running, okay? So that's just a little bit of background there uh, about why sometimes companies will use an accelerated method of depreciation, okay? So here we're looking at our forklift example again, okay? And we're going to make, we're using the exact same assumptions. We pay $24,000 for it. We think we're going to use it for five years, and the estimated residual value is $2,000, okay? So to uh, apply the double declining balance method, the first thing that you have to do is compute the straight line method, okay? This is really easy. The straight line method is always going to be 100% divided by the useful life. Okay, in this case, it's five years. So the straight line method would be 100% divided by five gives you 20%. Okay, if they had told us that the asset only had a four-year useful life, we would say 100% divided by four 
and the straight line method would be 25 percent okay so it's always going to be um, 100 percent divided by the useful life okay in this case it's five years so 100 percent divided by five gives us a 20 percent straight line rate therefore the double declining balance rate is just twice that okay it's just twice um, whatever the straight line method is now there is one area that will commonly trip folks up on the accelerated method. Um, and so let me show you this on the next slide. It's a little bit easier to see, okay? When we are applying the double declining balance method, we do not start with 22,000, okay? Instead, we start with that beginning book value of $24,000. We start with the cost not cost less depreciation, we start with the cost, okay? This is definitely the point that trips up people the most when, uh, you know, using the double declining balance, 100% declining balance, what have you. Always start with that full historical cost, okay? We apply the 40% to that. Now you say, well, what, what about that $2,000? What we do is we simply stop depreciating when we hit 2,000, okay? So we do not depreciate beyond the residual value. Once we get to the residual value, we simply stop. Okay, so let's look at how this works. Okay, so for year one, we take $24,000 times 40%. This gives us depreciation for year one of $9,600. Okay, now remember under the other two methods, we only came up with like 4,000 and something. Okay, that's why this is considered an accelerated method. We are recording much more depreciation expense in the early life of this asset, okay? So 24,000 times 40% gives us 9,600 depreciation in year one. The book value at the end of the year is always going to be the book value at the beginning of the year, in this case, 24,000. Oops, didn't mean to move that. <laughs> 24,000 times uh, I'm sorry, 24,000 minus the depreciation we recorded this year, the 9,600, that gives us book value at the end of the year of 14,400. Now, notice that 14,400 becomes our beginning book value at uh, the beginning of, of year two. Okay, so now we're going to take that amount times 40%. Depreciation in year two is going to be the $5,760 to get the end of year value, take the beginning of the year book value minus the depreciation that we just calculated. That gives us our ending value uh, for year two, which then becomes the beginning value for year three. Okay, then we take that times 40%. That gives us our depreciation for year three. End of year balance at year three is simply beginning balance minus the depreciation we just recorded. And this process continues, okay? Now, something interesting is going to happen in year five, okay? In year five, if we actually calculate the, the beginning uh, book value times 40%, all right, what's going to happen is we're going to get a number. In fact, we're going to get this number right here, this $1,244, okay? Well, if we, if we plug that in as depreciation, something's going to happen here, okay? The book value is going to fall below 2000 and we can't do that. We have to stop depreciation when we get to that residual value of $2,000. So for that reason, when we are using a declining balance method, the final year depreciation will pretty much always be a plug, okay? It is a plug simply. What do we have left to depreciate to get us down to uh, that salvage value, that residual value that we need to get to, okay? So in this case, it is $1,110.40. When we subtract that, that gets us exactly to our uh, $2,000 residual value, and that is where we stop our depreciation. So the key points to remember on the double declining balance method, one, always start with the total cost, okay? Do not subtract out uh, the residual value. You start with the total cost, okay? Second key point to remember is the last year will almost always be a plug figure. It is whatever you need to get to the residual value. Do not depreciate beyond the residual value, okay? So let's look at the total effect here of the declining balance method. 
And here it becomes very, very obvious why this is considered an accelerated method. You can see we are recording way more depreciation expense early in the asset's life. As the asset gets older and older and older, we're recording less depreciation expense. Again, we're assuming that it's less productive, probably not helping us to generate uh, as much revenue. And then it's also being partially offset with probably a lot of maintenance and repairs costs because, again, it's not in uh, the good shape that it was when we first uh, purchased it. Okay, so <clears throat> here is just a quick summary um, of the methods and the formulas that we use. Again, straight line method is the simplest method. We just take the depreciable cost um, and apply a constant rate of depreciation, recording the same amount each year. With units of activity, we compute an activity rate and apply that based on how much the asset is used um, during the year. And then with the double declining balance method, we depreciate at twice the rate of the straight line uh, rate. But again, the key is we start with the book value and just depreciate down to the residual value. Okay, one thing that we have to also consider with fixed assets are costs that are incurred after the asset is, is placed into use, after we are using it in our business. We have to differentiate between revenue expenditures and capital expenditures, okay? And essentially the reason it's important to differentiate between these two, capital expenditures will be capitalized on the balance sheet as a cost of the asset, okay? Revenue expenditures, on the other hand, are just gonna be expensed immediately on the income statement, all right? I can tell you the vast majority of expenses that are going to be incurred after uh, an asset is placed into use, the vast majority are going to be revenue expenditures, okay? They're just going to be regular expenses, regular service costs, repairs, maintenance, just regular things we need to do. Um, this can include any, you know, ongoing um, uh, taxes or insurance or, you know, uh, other costs like that that we have to pay. These are just going to be expensed immediately, okay? The only thing that can be capitalized is if we make some sort of major overhaul to this asset it, to the extent that it increases the, the productivity and extends the useful life of the asset, okay? So, <clears throat> for example, let's say that we had a, a big um, delivery truck, and let's say that we had the engine completely rebuilt, okay? That may legitimately extend the, the useful life uh, of the asset, and, and, you know, going beyond just standard repairs and maintenance, okay? So, so we may be able to get away with capitalizing that as a capital expenditure. Um, if we just, you know, replace the tires and change the oil and, and that kind of thing, that's considered just standard, ordinary uh, maintenance and repairs, and those types of things would be expensed immediately. <clears throat> okay, so um, let's talk a minute about intangible assets. Again, intangible assets are those assets, uh, they are long-term in nature, but they lack physical substance, okay? Some of the more common examples are going to be patents, copyrights, trademarks, and goodwill. Um, now, the neat thing about intangible assets is we we allocate the cost of intangible assets if they have a defined useful life, okay? <clears throat> um, for example, patents, copyrights, trademarks, we'll generally um, allocate those costs. We call it amortization. Amortization always is done on a straight line basis, so that makes it very, very simple. And we simply depreciate over the estimated useful life or legal life, whichever one is shorter, and that is in accordance with uh, the basic principle of conservatism uh, that we use in accounting. Now, assets like goodwill are considered indefinite lived assets, and we do not depreciate them. Instead, we are going to assess them on a regular basis for impairment. And here's a quick summary of this. Um, <clears throat> now, one interesting thing that I want to point out here is um, and that this isn't always mentioned, but even for uh, even for the assets that we record amortization on, most companies are going to 
still evaluate those for impairment on a regular basis. This could be things like um, patents, uh, copyrights, uh, technology license, franchise rights, anything like that. Um, and to do that, management will generally look at the estimated future cash flows that they expect to get associated um, with that given asset and compare that against the current carrying value of the asset. So that's something, um, you know, it, it may look like only the indefinite lived assets are tested for impairment, but that's not necessarily the case. Most companies will also look at those others to, to see if there could potentially be an impairment loss. But again, for those that we record amortization expense on, it is, a, it is on a straight line basis, um, so it's very simple. Um, and then the others we are not going to amortize. Now that's something interesting because, and as you if as you take other uh, accounting courses, um, you'll learn that for tax purposes, goodwill is amortized, but for financial reporting purposes, it is not. It is only tested for impairment, and we only record an expense associated with it <coughs> if it is deemed uh, if if we deem that the current fair value of it. Um, is less than its current carrying value, and at that point, we would record it as, uh, uh, as an impairment loss. Okay, last thing, and I just thought this was pretty neat. I found this little uh, chart here. Um, this looks at uh, 500 large firms, and we see the frequency which they carry certain uh, intangible assets on their balance sheet. So you can see um, that uh, intangible assets are very, very, very common. Um, you know, out, out of 500 firms, 435 of them actually reported goodwill. Um, and then you see a lot, a lot of them also, um, you know, carry some of these other examples of intangible assets. Um, in addition to having them reported on the balance sheet, you can oftentimes find quite a bit of detail on intangible assets in the financial statement footnote disclosures. So that's just something else for you to consider.